Good morning. Before we start our service today, I want to let you know that our speaker, Dr. Ken Coates, is with us in person, sort of. But as you can see, he's not sitting up with me on the stage. Instead, he's with us live on Zoom from Whitehorse, watching us from the computer over by Catherine. Now, just to explain, Ken was hoping to be with us here in person today. Uh, he, he was going to be flying from Saskatoon, where he lives, to, and then come here, go to Whitehorse, where he's working this week, but the schedule just got too tight. So instead, he's recorded his reflections specifically for our congregation this morning, and he'll be up there on the big screen, uh, but you'll, he'll also be watching you out in the pews from the computer, so no falling asleep. And uh, Ken will introduce himself a bit later, but I will just note that a key part of his life's work involves Indigenous people from communities across Canada and elsewhere. And he truly lives in the spirit of reconciliation, and he works hard to make it happen. Our opening words were taken from the oratory of Chief Dan George. Chief George was born Geswanuth Slahut, but his name was changed to Dan George when he went to residential school at age five. He eventually, you may know this, became chief of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, our close neighbors here on the North Shore. And he was also an actor, a musician, a poet, and an author and as his words will reveal, a very wise man. He died in 1981. And just to, to warn you, these opening words are a little bit longer than normal, so please just settle in and get comfortable and imagine that it's Dan George speaking directly to you out there. What I've seen. In the course of my lifetime, I have lived in two distinct cultures. I was born into a culture that lived in communal houses. My grandfather's house was 80 feet long, and it stood down by the beach along the inlet. All my uncles and their families lived in this dwelling. Their sleeping apartments were separated by blankets made of bulrush weeds, and one open fire in the middle served the cooking needs of all. And in houses like these throughout the tribe, people learned to live with one another learned to respect the rights of one another. Children shared the thoughts of the adult world and found themselves surrounded by extended family who loved them. In houses like this, we learned from infancy how to be at home with people. And beyond this acceptance, there was a deep respect for everything in nature. The earth was my father's second mother, and everything in it was considered a gift from the great spirit. I can still see him as the sun rose above the mountaintops. I can see him standing by the water's edge with his arms raised above his head while he softly moaned, thank you, thank you. It left a deep impression on my young mind and I shall never forget his disappointment when once he caught me gaffing for fish for the fun of it. My son, he said, the great spirit gave you those fish to be your brothers to feed you when you are hungry. You must respect them. You must not kill them for fun. This then was the culture I was born into and for some years the only one I really tasted. This is why I find it hard to accept many of the things I see now around me. I see people living in huge houses while the people next door may not even know each other. I see the deep hate among people that justifies vicious wars. It is hard for me to understand a culture that spends more on wars and weapons than it does on education and ways to help us develop. It's hard for me to understand a culture that even attacks nature and abuses her. 
I see my white brothers going about blotting out nature from his cities. I've seen him strip the hills bare, leaving ugly wounds on the face of the mountains. I see him tearing things from the bosom of Mother Earth as though she were a monster who refused to share her treasure with him. I see him po throw poison in the waters, indifferent to the life he kills there, and I see him choke the air with deadly fumes. My white brother does many things well, for he's more clever than my people. But I wonder if he has ever really learned to love. Perhaps he only loves the things that are outside and beyond him. And this, of course, is not love at all. For man must love all creation, or he will love none of it. Man must love fully, or he will become the lowest of the animals. Love is something you and I must have because our spirit feeds on it, and without it, we become weak and faint. Without love, our self-esteem weakens, and without it, our courage fails. Without love, we can no longer look out confidently at the world. Instead, we turn inward and begin to feed upon our own personalities. And little by little, we destroy ourselves. You and I need the strength and joy that comes from knowing that we are loved. With it, we are creative. With it, we march tirelessly. With it and with it alone, we are able to sacrifice for others. I'm afraid my culture has little to offer yours, but my culture did prize friendship and companionship. It did not look on privacy as a thing to be clung to, for privacy builds walls and promotes distrust. My culture did not prize the hoarding of private possessions. In fact, to hoard was a shameful thing among my people. The Indian looked on all things in nature as belonging to him, and he expected to share them with others and to take only what he needed. Everyone likes to give as well as receive. No one wishes to receive all the time. We have taken something from your culture. I wish you had taken something from our culture, for there are some beautiful and good things in it. Soon it will be too late to know my culture, for integration is upon us, and soon we will have no values but yours. Already many of our young people have forgotten the old ways, and many, as a result of scorn and ridicule, have been ashamed of their Indian ways. My culture is like a wounded deer that has crawled away into the forest and bleed and die alone. Quite a strong metaphor, isn't it? My culture is like a wounded deer that has crawled away into the forest to bleed and die alone. The only thing that can truly help us is genuine love. You must truly love us, be patient with us, and share with us. And we must love you too with a genuine love that forgives and forgets, a love that replaces the terrible suffering that your culture brought to ours when it swept over us like a wave crashing along the beach. A love that forgets and lifts up its head and sees in your eyes an answering love of trust and acceptance. This is brotherhood. Anything less is not worthy of the name. I have spoken. Touching words indeed, and I'm happy that we in Canada now find ourselves on a path toward reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. But that path doesn't come with an instruction manual, which perhaps has made us a bit tentative about how to begin the journey. For a while, we were even afraid to sing Indigenous music for fear of being accused of cultural appropriation. But the good news is things are changing. We now see, and I'm sure you've seen it everywhere, we now see indigenous culture blossoming in this country. 
And the two anthems that our choir is going to sing today were written by indigenous Canadian composers for all of us to sing and appreciate. They want to share their culture with us because, as Chief Dan George said, there are many beautiful and good things in it. The first anthem, Gimme Quend and Ina, is from the Canadian musical Children of God. If you haven't seen it, put it on your radar. It's fabulous. But in the musical, an Ojibwe Cree brother and sister, Tommy and Julia, are sent to a residential school in northern Ontario. And as the school tries to take the Indian out of the child, they struggle to remember their language, family, and culture. Tommy asks his sister, do you remember what you are called? Where, do you remember where you are from? Do you remember our fathers and mothers, our sisters and brothers? Do you hear them calling you?
maybe that song really represents the cultural blossoming <laughs> that we're experiencing these days. And on that powerful note, I want to officially welcome you to this morning, this day, and this chance to be together with people who aspire to love widely and well. My name is Sue Forbes, and I'm your service coordinator today. And as I said, our guest speaker is Ken Coates, a man of great depth and knowledge. Our Sunday mornings can be a time of joy, comfort, and sometimes challenge, because in this congregation we gather to learn about being human, about being in relationship with others and with ourselves, about how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to build trust and compassion within, among, and beyond. And today on this Truth and Reconciliation Weekend, we're learning about how to live in the spirit of reconciliation and find inspiration through engagement with Indigenous peoples. So welcome to this community of care, especially newcomers. We'd love to get, you know, get to know you all as we try to live deeply, make friends, and have some joy along the way. And in that vein, please stand now or sit as you prefer to sing about love between our brothers and our sisters all over this land. That sounded wonderful. You were put right in the mood by that, by that indigenous song first. Um, and now, we kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. And in this congregation of care, we hold and witness one another through the seasons of our lives. In this moment, may our sanctuary hold whatever is in your hearts this morning. There is room here for joy and sorrow, celebration and mourning, and everything in between. And today, other side, today we particularly think of our longtime member, Janelle Hilton, who after a long illness died at the time of her own choosing this past Thursday, September 26th. Prior to her passing, Janelle enjoyed an informal celebration of life with her niece, Shelley Knowles, and many friends from this congregation and elsewhere. We are honored to have Shelley with us today. And Shelley, we're sorry for your loss. And please know that Janelle will be missed by all of us. 
So for that which has been shared and for all that remains in the silent sanctuaries of your hearts, we light a candle of hope and caring for our community. That's it. That's it. And now to part one of living in the spirit of reconciliation. Welcome, Ken. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Coates. I'm delighted to be with you this morning, even though it's through using technology and telephone connections. Um, I'm delighted to be with you at the North Shore Unitarian Church and to have the chance to join in your fellowship and your friendship and your exploration uh, of spiritual and, and social matters. Um, I've enjoyed the friendship and the fellowship of Mary and, and Sue Forbes for a very long time. Uh, we share an island with them in Decorsi Island. You probably heard them tell about talk about that an awful lot of time. It's a very, very special place uh, where sort of community is sort of redefined in the 21st century context where we discuss wonderful big issues all the time with Barry and, and, and with Sue. And I've always been so impressed with their passion for life, their, their passion for social justice, their, their desire to sort of live a proper life and a full life in a way that is meaningful and has an impact on, on their friends and on their community. And I've always particularly enjoyed their wonderful conversations about the North Shore Unitarian Church. They they find great joy, great peace in your fellowship. Uh, they obviously believe that, it, as, as I've come to believe, that it represents the very best of what a congregation is all about, a mutual challenge, a mutual support, um, of searching together uh, for sort of the unknowable. Um, and I, I join you in that, that search and that conversation. Um, my own background is fairly fairly simple to describe. I was raised in the Yukon. I've gone through all you know, university degrees. I've taught at universities in various places. Um, and I'm very interested in the issues of, of Indigenous peoples. It's been a, a theme of my entire professional career, both as a professional historian and later in public policy, looking at Indigenous rights and Indigenous economic development. It remains a huge passion of mine. Um, but it actually is, go back to where I started. Um, I was raised in Whitehurst. Whitehurst at the time when I was growing up, I was about 30% Aboriginal. My graded high school class was 30% Aboriginal, uh, First Nations people. Uh, my high school graduating class, my grade 8 was 30%. My graduating class was less than 1%. Um, and I grew up with the reality of the Indigenous lives and, and justice toward Indigenous people sort of playing out in real time in front of us. The, the poverty, the isolation, the marginalization, the discrimination. Um, and I can't say that when I was in grade 8, 9, 10, and 11 that I understood what I was seeing. But over time, I really clearly came to understand that the world in which I grew up in was one filled with inequalities and injustice. And that deserved a, um, a far sub more substantial reconstruction and reevaluation um, than we were what actually seen to date. The good news is the Yukon is probably further along the path toward reconciliation than almost any place in Canada. Doesn't mean it's fixed. Maybe we'll talk about this in the questions and answers afterwards. Doesn't mean it's got all the answers or solved all the problems, but it is a very, very special kind of place. In the session to date, uh, we've discussed with Sue about organizing this in, in two sections. I'm going to talk about first about sort of defining reconciliation, explaining the need to move forward together. Um, I want to look at the elements of, of what a journey toward reconciliation might, can, might, might include. Um, having, having done that, um, I would like to sort of focus on the journey itself. What what can you do as individuals and as a congregation? And I'll explain that a little bit as we talk about this first little little, little piece, um, because I think it's, it's, it's we all want to have reconciliation. We just don't know how to get there. Um, and it leaves us feeling unfulfilled and feeling sort of that we've done something unjust, that we, we haven't met our promise and our commitment. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm really pleased that as a congregation, you've undertaken the journey of reconciliation. Um, like many of you, uh, most of you perhaps, I'm a non-Indigenous person. I've spent a lot of time thinking about and working on this whole questions of, of reconciliation, trying to figure out uh, what I could do that was right, what that would actually move the needle in the right direction and move Canada and so individual communities um, along a path towards re reconciliation. But, but let's, let's be clear about some things. Um, reconciliation, even the journey of reconciliation, um, basically is proceeding without a map. Um, we don't really know where we're going. 
We don't know what the trail markers are. There are no trail markers. Nobody's going to stand up one day and say, hey, you're a quarter of the way there. Or, boy, you're almost halfway there. Or, you're doing really well. Keep going. It's not going to happen. Um, there's no clear destination. You can't look up, up ahead and see on the horizon and say, big X in the sky that says, hey, this is where reconciliation is. And most importantly for Canadians, there's no scorecard and no metrics. We, we love metrics and scorecards. We like to know that we're, we're partway there. We've done our bit. We've, we're making progress. We like to see that. I always put it this way. We will collectively know, meaning Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, that we've achieved reconciliation when in, Indigenous people feel truly comfortable in Canada. And it's really fair to say right now they do not. Many parts of the country, they feel very much at risk at almost all times. Um, we will also know that we've achieved reconciliation when Indigenous people have an appropriate level of prosperity. Not defined in sort of North Vancouver terms, not described in Saskatchewan terms, but described in Indigenous terms, that, that, that they're, they're as prosperous as they wish to be, given lifestyle preferences, desire to be on the land, living in small communities and what have you. And we'll achieve reconciliation when Indigenous folks are truly treated fairly and equitably in all aspects of Canadian life, in the legal system, policing system, in the prison system, in the healthcare system, um, in education, um, in, in the economy, in politics, all those areas. Um, they, they aren't even close. Um, we've, we're not close to reconciliation. I always say when you start talking about reconciliation that it's, it's a thousand yard race, just to give us some nice Canadian number that we like to have. It's a thousand yard race. And right now, we've just taken a step out of the starting blocks. So, so don't be hard on yourself if you don't know exactly how far we have to go or how much energy you can consume. Nobody knows. We don't know. There's no roadmap, no trail markers. It doesn't work that way. So let's think about where we are right now. What is reconciliation? I feel uncomfortable about even somebody even saying this, and I don't want you to misunderstand because you'll discover as we go along that I think Canadians have a lot to atone for, that we've done some things horribly wrong, that the injustices pile upon injustice upon injustice over, over hundreds of years, um, and that Indigenous people have been treated extremely poorly uh, within this political system we call Canada. But right now, reconciliation is equated with guilt and apologies. Um, I sometimes joke that our Prime Minister is Canada's chief apologist, and that that's how he sees his role. And I think, quite frankly, not to be political, but I think he's weakened apologies by issuing so many of them. Um, but, but it sort of leaves us with this idea that we should be wrapped by guilt, personal guilt, not collective guilt, but personal guilt uh, for, for what has happened and what hasn't happened. I actually believe that that's wrong, that, that reconciliation is not about, you know, sort of throwing yourself on the floor and prostrating yourself and saying, I'm really sorry, I saw it's terrible circumstance, that reconciliation really starts today. And it's about understanding and engagement. It's about understanding what Indigenous people endured, what Indigenous people achieved, what Indigenous people experience even now, but also about engagement, about getting past this point of dealing with Indigenous people as though they're on the other side of a fence, or on the other side of a valley, that they're distant people who, who don't have anything to do with us. Reconciliation is when Indigenous peoples are your friends, when they're your neighbors, and when they're your colleagues, when you're learning from them and they're learning from you. That's where we get there. That's where we start to see real movement. But in my mind, guilt generates defensiveness. There's a lot of people in Canada pushing back against efforts at re reconciliation. We've gone too far. We've spent too much money. We've done this and that. And the money thing is important because in Canada, we've got a habit of equating money with affection. That when we when we spend lots of money on something, if we really believe in that very strongly, we really want to love you. So we spend a lot of money on Quebec. Please love us. We'll send you lots of money. We spent a lot of money on Indigenous people. For the last 20 years, the amount of money spent by government of Canada has gone up about three times. Um, and that's not counting court settlements and legal settlements and negotiated agreements. That's just the core spending. So look, we, we must like you. We're spending lots of money. Hasn't really had any kind of the impact we thought it might. Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, um, and, and Inuit are not sitting there saying, oh, you wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you for sending us money. Or thank you for feeling guilty. It isn't how it works. So as you start the journey, it's really important. We'll talk about the technicalities of this afterwards. 
start with an awareness of the challenges. Where did the conflict come from? Where did the unfairness come from? Where did the hurt come from? You know, what were the things that happened, not by us, not by our parents or our grandparents, but even before that, that actually set this, 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 this journey of, the, of such suffering and hardship on Indigenous people? Understand what Indigenous peoples have gone through by learning to listen to Indigenous people as carefully as, as you possibly can. Um, having started from somewhere, you're not going to get perfect understanding. I've been working on this for 40 years and 50 years, and I don't have perfect understanding even close. But once you start the journey, it's really important that you maintain openness, that you're open to new ideas, that there's a real desire for learning, that you're going to learn more tomorrow than you know today, and that a, a decade from now or a week from now or a month from now, you'll know more than you did at this particular moment. And, and, and not just learning about Indigenous world, but experiencing the Indigenous world. And actually, at, at, at a time of their choosing, at a, situations that they sort of control. And um, so you're open to that kind of experience. The journey, will, as I say, will never really be completed. Um, but the aspiration will be fulfilled when you as individuals and you as a congregation have joyous engagement. Not, not guilt-ridden engagement, not apologetic engagement but joyous engagement when you see Indigenous people in the richness and vitality of their culture, when you celebrate their resilience, when you celebrate their continuity, when you celebrate the fact that Indigenous people were standing where you are standing right now 7,000 years ago, maybe 8,000 years ago, and that they have persisted through all that time, through so many trials and tribulations. And when you realize by looking around you that Indigenous people are in fact your friends and they are your colleagues, and they're your teachers, and they're your neighbors. And that that's where you sort of look up and you realize the world has changed in very interesting kinds of ways. So my suggestion to you when you sort of contemplate this journey of reconciliation is that you be easy on yourself. Do not start from a position of guilt or huge moral responsibility. That you have to personally overturn the evils of several hundred years sort of overnight, but to take a somewhat different, different approach. Base it on re respect for Indigenous people um, that you have, and I hope you will, just to truly admire what they what they represent as cultures and as languages and as spiritual worldviews and as environmental understanding. This is great stuff, and it's just so rich and so deep and so powerful. But also match that with a desire for personal growth, that you recognize that that reaching out toward Indigenous people is actually making you a stronger and a better person. The reconciliation is about growing stronger together, not about sort of learning more and hating yourself or hating your culture or hating your history. That stuff just doesn't work. We we toppled statues of McDonald's and we've 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 renamed buildings. And I can tell you, there's not a single indigenous child in a remote northern Ontario community or northern BC village that feels better as a consequence. It just doesn't. That isn't working out. It must make white people feel differently or non-indigenous people feel differently, but it isn't really having much of a much of an effect. We have to realize, and that in your congregation and your Unitarian church is so really good at this, the, the importance of sort of key elements. Respect cultural diversity, the spirituality, the worldview, the knowledge base, the understanding of all peoples. You know, understand what we know from our traditions, but understand what they know from their traditions. To Exercise and develop personal and collective humility. A lot of the problems facing by Indigenous people came from the fact that, that Europeans were not humble. They were aggressive. They were assertive. They were colonizers in a traditional way. So well, share that humility. And, and don't be afraid to ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to sound not so intelligent or not so knowledgeable. Ask lots of questions. Um, and, and at the end, I would say this. As you go on this journey, please... Seek and find genuine pleasure in the willingness of Indigenous people to share their history, their culture, their values, and their dreams. We'll know what they've been through. You know part of this story already. But when you look at that and you think, at the end of that day, why are they the ones extending their hands to us? Why are they inviting us to their ceremonies and to, to their celebrations and into their longhouses and into their political meetings and into all these kinds of things? I mean, they are humble, um, they're open, 
reach out to that hand, grab that hand, and start a wonderful journey together. We'll be back again to talk to you shortly. As we ponder Ken's words, Allison will light a third candle, a candle of reconciliation, what I'm calling a candle of reconciliation, to remind us that this region is our home, but not just ours. The lands we live on, the mountains that ground us, the rivers, forests, and meadows that surround us, these are all the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. So today we light a candle to honor the lives and legacies of our neighbors who at various times in their history were unwillingly displaced from their homes and separated from their families and cultures. Let us remember the terrible suffering that swept over them like a wave crashing along the beach as everything changed. Hello, it's great to be back with you again. Um, we're going to talk this time about the, the journey. What do you actually do to sort of move down that, that sort of path toward reconciliation? Um, and I want to make clear in the first instance that this is no travel guide. There's no ABCs, one, two, threes, four, five, sixes. Um, that basically, this is really more about a mindset. That it's a journey of your mind, a journey of your soul, a journey of your spirit, more than it is a journey of your body or a journey of your congregation. Um, you go into this, eyes wide open. Be friendly, be welcoming, be all-embracing, and be questioning. Questioning about yourself, about non-Indigenous society, about Indigenous society. Try to learn and make this a learning process from the very beginning. Let me start by giving you an example of sort of how not, what not to do. In relation to the United Church of Canada, um, and I was raised as an adult, or as an adult, I was a member of the United Church. And many years ago, Back in the, in the 1980s, um, there was a meeting of the General Council, which is the large national gathering of the United Church. They get together to set policy in place. And at that time, they had something called an all-native con all native, uh, con conference. And this was uh, all the Indigenous-led United Churches across the country sort of got together. There was BC Conference and Manitoba Conference and all-native conference. Um, and they, what happened was the all-native conference came forward and they said, we would actually like you as United Church to consider an apology, um, partly for the role in residential schools, but more generally uh, for their role in sort of suppressing Indigenous culture and languages and traditions. Um, and they invited them to sort of take a year. Uh, the, the council meets every two years and take two years, go back to your congregations and study at the local level what happened. What did that your church do in each one of these regions? And then get back together in two years and decide if you were ready to apologize. So they went outside, the members of the All Native Congress uh, conference went outside, and the rest of the meeting went ahead. And somebody sort of stood up and said, hey, listen, you know, we, we really feel badly about what happened. Why don't we apologize now? We don't have to wait two years. Let's apologize right now. I'll bet you they'll really appreciate that. We're just grabbing the, grabbing the bull by the horns and moving ahead. So they invited the people from the All Native Conference back in, and they said, we've decided we're not going to apologize in two years. We're going to apologize now. I'm paraphrasing, obviously as I go along. And and the Indigenous people were hurt. They were really offended, and they, in a mild, gentle way, and they sort of said, you didn't listen. We wanted you to go away and study. We wanted you to go away and reflect on what your church had done, what you had done as a community, what you had done as individuals. And we wanted you to sort of come to the conclusion one way or the other that an apology was necessary or not necessary. So to be honest, we don't accept your apology. And we'll come back in two years' time at the next general council, and we'll judge how you've done, and we'll tell you whether we think you've made enough of a journey. So two years later, they met. And this time in Victoria, I happened to be in the meeting room when this was actually taking place. And the only native conference got up on the board, up on the stage, and they said, we watched what you did. We listened to what you're talking about. And we don't accept your apology. You, you didn't do what you, we thought you were going to do, we, what we asked you to do. We wanted you to take a serious local community by community study of what had actually happened. 
and and the church instead of going forward in celebration um actually went forward in dismay because the people were offended themselves we apologize isn't that good enough for you no it wasn't actually good enough for you we wanted something quite different so we're now in a situation where where partly because of that kind of a, a, a circumstance where we have these quick apologies and the quick atonement and the quick ask for forgiveness that, that people are now actually afraid of getting started we don't know what the right thing to do is therefore we don't know what the wrong thing to do is um, do we wait for Indigenous people to come to us, or do we go to them first? And what happens is, I mentioned this before, that the guilty approach, the, the, the fact that we should feel bad about the past, has actually made people very feel fearful. Also, the fact that everybody wants to do reconciliation. Companies, governments, communities, community organizations, elementary schools, reconciliation is everywhere. So how do you possibly make progress as individuals, families as congregations as communities so we'll start with this try not to be afraid i mean indigenous folks are genuine they have the most ferocious sense of humor you'll ever imagine they actually don't expect very much from non-indigenous people we've we've harmed them for a long time we've ignored them we have misunderstood them so they're probably going to laugh at your mistakes rather than get mad at you they are open they're respectful what they want you to do is to proceed thoughtfully um, and and listen carefully. And you should do that. Listen carefully to the Indigenous people you meet for encouragement, for advice, and for welcomes. When they extend their hand, as I mentioned before, please shake it. Uh, please shake it. Please take it. Please make a move step toward them when they ask you to do so. So how do you prepare for the journey? I'm a professional historian. I've been studying and reading and writing history for a very, very long time. But I think you really should to read a lot of history. You get started individually and collectively. Make a book club within the church, make it within your congregation. Um, you know, study amongst yourselves or share books around or whatever else. Happy to give you some recommendations in, in this regard. But you have to understand what actually happened. Um, and then not just the history is in something in the distant past, because we tend to, I really get upset about the focus on Johnny McDonald and, and some of the things that are done in, and some of the early uh, Ed, the Edgerton Ryerson situation was particularly offensive. Um, he was one of the great social activists of the 19th century. He did more to alleviate poverty and elevate uh, people to a sort of a higher standard than almost anybody of that time. And to have him, because he wrote one or two things that were misinterpreted uh, by modern people, he actually gets reviled and sort of condemned. It's just not right. Um, but what you should be doing is read about the past, but realize that a lot of the problems are local, are local and recent. Um, so read Indigenous biographies. Um, take a look and see what actually happened more recently. So do learn about the big, big issues. Um, disease killed 90% of Indigenous people in, in North America in the first 100 years of contact. Um, learn about the Indian Act and the, the way in which it, the government suffocated Aboriginal people through reserves and, and the Indian Act legislation. Learn about post-World War II paternalism. When we thought we were doing the right thing, we, in quotation marks, gave them houses, we gave them welfare, we we, we you know, gave them an Indian agent to look after their affairs. You know, paternalism hurts. Paternalism is suffocating in its own way. And the post-war period was as destructive as almost any other in Canadian history. And through it all, as you read through all these things, you'll he hear the constant refrain of resistance <clears throat> of Indigenous people standing up for their rights, asking for fairness, asking for justice, and more often than not, just asking government to honour their own obligations and legal rights. And please read contemporary uh, literature and contemporary uh, biographies. Um, there's some remarkable, some of the world's best Indigenous writers, some of the world's best writers are Indigenous people. Uh, they do wonderful jobs of explaining their reality. You know, you won't all read, find satisfaction in the same books. Read a bunch of different books, read poetry, read music, watch theater, watch drama, whatever it is you do, but learn about it. So in other words, contextualize. If you haven't studied this before, learn about it, understand where it's going. And secondly, make a real effort to know the people next to you, the Indigenous people in your communities. Really important in British Columbia. Now, First Nation, the concept of a First Nation suggests that they're all the same. Not at all. There's 636 First Nations in the country, plus the Métis, plus the Inuit. And they vary enormously. Well, the, the culture and history and lifestyle on the, on, the, on the coast, completely different than that in the northern Yukon or the Mackenzie Valley. Um, there are many First Nations learn their names, learn their pronunciation. Sometimes that's very difficult. 
understand their, their history and relationships. And um, when you go through this material, please try to develop a balanced view. Canadians are very good at self-criticism. We're very good at sort of finding fault with ourselves. And when you look at the Indigenous file, you can find lots of that. So look at the challenges facing Indigenous people. Massive overrepresentation in the prison system. Dis dis treated so poorly by the police and by the jails and things of that nature. Um, the opioid ep epidemic is destructive beyond belief in Indigenous communities in the last couple of years. And Indigenous poverty is very, very real. Indigenous people earn much less than the Canadian average. They live in overcrowded homes, et cetera, et cetera. And the missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls is a real phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon of 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's a phenomenon of yesterday. And it's a serious, serious problem that, that we have to sort of take collective responsibility for. So look at those issues. Look at the challenges and take them to, take them to heart. But also make sure you balance that by looking for the more, more constructive things that are ha happening, which are equally remarkable and really quite impressive. There's an artistic renaissance in Indigenous society that is unbelievable. The political transformation in Indigenous governments through legal and, and negotiated settlements is absolutely staggering. Um, Aboriginal self-government is a reality. Modern treaties are realities. Now, look at community resilience, communities that suffered. Alkali Lake, which was a community suffering from widespread alcoholism, and because of the work of an eight-year-old eight girl, who actually locked her parents out of her house and said, come back when you're sober, this community turned itself around and became actually quite a sober community and quite, and quite successful. But look also at things like business development. There are 350 Aboriginal economic development corporations in the country. In the last year, there's been 12 Aboriginal business deals worth more than a billion dollars. Take a look at the, the constructive things that are happening, some of them right in your backyard. If you don't know what Squamish and Muskingum are doing on residential development uh, over on over on False Creek and in Burrard Inlet, it's staggering. Billions of dollars worth of development actually taking place. So, so make sure you, as you develop this sense, don't go wallow in the problems. Understand the problems. They're there. They're real. But but step aside and make sure you look and say, boy, that poetry is fantastic. The music is amazing. The dancing, the, the carvings, these are great signs. And so are the political achievements. So attend the cultural events. Watch for them in your community. Go individually, but go as a family, go, as, go as, a, as a congregation, to dances, to singers. Go to ceremonies. Be a spectator in the lives of the, the lived lives, current lives of Indigenous people. When the time is right, and you'll know that yourselves, amongst yourselves, reach out to Indigenous congregations. Um, offer to hold joint, joint searches, services. Um, ask them if it's okay if you come down as a group and just sit in the back rows and and listen to their service and see how they how they study and how they learn. Um, organize visits between your two churches and, and meet with each other. Have have joint dinners, start conversations. You know, just do small things. They don't have to all be big. Just small things to get it started. Invite First Nations people to, to your services and your congregations. Um, sometimes this is best done. Aboriginal people celebrate through having meals. Um, invite them to prepare a meal. Make sure you pay for it, but invite them to to organize a meal uh, for, your, for your congregation so you can share in their food and they can explain their food and talk about the, the culture that lies in behind it. And when you are ready and when you know your, your First Nations partners and other partners are ready, invite their knowledge keepers to talk about their spirituality and their worldview. They will not share everything. A lot of stuff is actually sacred and doesn't get shared with non-Indigenous populations or even with other First Nations. But what they will, when they're ready, invite them to come and talk about how they understand the world and understand the seasonal rhythms and understand their relationship with the land and, and with animals and that, that nature. Um, when you start having personal contact, you'll, you'll, you'll do more of these all the time. And one by one, individually and collectively, you're going to make friends. Um, indigenous people are the friendliest people you'll find. They are ferociously funny. They're, they're very welcoming uh, across the board. Um, when you start having personal contacts and personal friendships, just straight out say, what's the best way for us to engage? We're, here's the journey we're on. Here's where, what we're trying to do through reconciliation. What works for you? And what's the best way that will make you feel that we understand that we support their, their circumstances? And, and you get to the point where, and I see this happening sort of all the time. It's interesting, happening in the resource sector, where non-Aboriginal people, corporate executives and things like that, are joining celebrations, but also joining funerals. 
They're, they're with the First Nations in times of happiness and in times of deep sorrow. And it's when you're there with them at all times and they realize that you really care and are part of, of their cultural culture and their circle of friends and influences, um, boy, good things really start to happen. So get to the point where you're starting to talk about joint events and celebrations. That won't be tomorrow. That won't even be in 2025 or maybe or even not till 2026. It takes a while to build up to this. And you have to move at a pace where you're you're comfortable. So you don't forcing yourself on Indigenous people or, or feeling that they're forcing themselves on you. You've got to find this carefully. So my suggestion is really simple. I'm not asking for revolutions. I'm not asking for a, a master plan. I'm not suggesting you do things in any particular order. There's no systematic way to do this. But start by being humble and go gently. Um, don't go with the kind of characteristic European bravado and European assertiveness. You know, in one sense, let First Nations have the upper hand. We need them to tell us when they're ready to share their knowledge with us and to share their experiences with us. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. Um, you know, don't be, unless you're one of complete belligerence, don't, don't be belligerent at all. But in, Indigenous people have had much worse things done to them than anything you're going to do. Um, and if you just reach out too soon or, or, or approach the wrong organization or the wrong person, you're going to be fine. That, you're going to find that that's there. You're going to overcome that very, very quickly. So growth and change will come slowly. It won't happen immediately. But when it happens, I hope it's with joy. And I was, you'll, you'll, you'll experience real joy in reaching out to Indigenous people and seeing what they share with you because they will share just about everything. And I find real excitement. I've, I've shared in this myself many, many times over the years. So lots of different settings, but literally around the world in Australia, New Zealand, and Scandinavia. All right, be open to new learning. Explore new spiritualities. Discover new worldviews. Discover new histories and, and see Vancouver differently and British Columbia and Canada differently by looking at the, the world as they experienced it and by understanding the, the spiritual environment as they see it. These are really exciting things. You're getting access to a seven, eight thousand year old time since time immemorial understanding of humanity, understanding of society, understanding of the environment. So understand that when you go on this journey of reconciliation, um, to make it almost a little bit you know, um, selfish for you. New worlds await. This is a, something for you that will be truly special and truly wonderful. That new levels of awareness will, in fact, make you look at Canada differently and not always very optimistically. Um, you, you know, you'll be wanting the governments to do even more. You'll be wanting to share more authority, more power. Those are all good things. Don't worry about that part of it. But you're going to learn so much more. And you're going to see the world in such a different sort of way. And it doesn't mean abandoning yours or criticizing your own world or rejecting everything that you believe. It means sort of putting these things so you're walking, as they used to say, in two-row wampum. Two canoes traveling down a road together. Coming close together sometimes, but sending far apart at other times. That's okay. That's okay. We're not trying to make everybody the same. We're simply trying to respect and understand each other. This is the journey of reconciliation. You will have a fabulous, fabulous time. Thank you so much for inviting me today. And does really make it sound exciting to head down this path, doesn't he, this path of reconciliation. And today we're going to make take more baby steps by sharing another powerful and joyful Indigenous anthem.
it's great fun singing that music as the choir, something totally different, but once we got onto it, I think we really get into it. <laughs> um, as our ushers come forward to take our offering, let's ponder what we can do to promote reconciliation. Perhaps you'd like to begin by making a donation to the Indian Residential School Survivors Society, whose name speaks for itself. So unless you indicate otherwise on your envelope, 100% of our collected offerings today will go to support this worthy organization. And if you have your name in Breeze or have your name on the whatever you contribute, uh, you'll get a tax receipt for this as well. And also, I think there are two or three Allison got these shirts for the choir, these um, shirts that uh, you see lots of people wearing around now in Vancouver as you move around in recognition of uh, children everywhere, indigenous children that have been lost and survived. And many thanks to all the people who helped create our service today and especially to our speaker, Ken Coates, as I said earlier, Ken, uh, you've made reconciliation sound so exciting, and we so appreciate sharing your ideas with us today. So we'll give you a hand. Thank you. And I also have to especially thank Malcolm Mallory today because uh, he so patiently saves my backside for all things technical. And it's through his wizardry that this all came together today. When, when Ken's videos came in on Friday, he was lying on one side for one of them and on the other side for the other, and I somehow, <laughs> Malcolm got him upright. <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. <sighs> so please stay after our service for a live Q&A with Ken. Um, just so you know, this part of the service will not be recorded, the Q&A, and so we want you to come with all of your questions. Um, grab some refreshments upstairs here at the back of the room prepared by our wonderful hostess Diane Hicks and uh, then you can come right back up here for the open discussion and as you've already seen Ken is a fount of knowledge and he's up for any questions you may have and if you prefer to ask them anonymously just write them on a piece of paper and I have a basket ah, here we are <laughs> with questions in it already and uh, just plop them into this basket while you have your uh, get your coffee and I'll be going through the questions and presenting them to Ken and then he will be up live and I think the sound will be a bit, little better in the Q&A it was a little bit muffled wasn't it for the uh, reflections but anyway um, next Sunday Leslie White formerly Gibbons will help us navigate through this complicated world while while holding on to our integrity and our Unitarian principles. And she'll use the little book, The Four Agreements, to help us on our way. If you haven't read it, it's a great little book. And she says, you know, it doesn't really have to be difficult. With a little humor, we might even all agree. And uh, just to, Diane says that the meditation is on tomorrow morning, uh, even though it's a holiday weekend. And uh, who doesn't remember the fun of Bunko? Watch out. We did a survey last uh, spring, this, or summer, sorry, summer, in which we asked people what they thought was missing here, not what was missing, but what would be good to add. And one of the things was community engagement, getting together as a congregation just for fun on a, on a particular night. Well, we're starting it off with Bunko. Now, has anybody here ever played strip poker? Remember, you're in a church and you have to, you have to be honest. Anybody ever played strip poker? Ah, Marsha, Marsha, Jim. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Bunko is uh, like, kind of like strip poker, on, only with dice. Not. <laughs> anyway, it's a dice game. And there's absolutely no skill required to play this game. Absolutely no skill. I have played this game probably 40 times. I've never won. So it's, it's got nothing to do with whether you've played before. It's got everything to do with how well you roll dice. It's here in the church on the 18th of October at 7 o'clock. 
We have 20 people already signed up. We will take 32. So uh, we would encourage you to come and have fun, enjoy yourselves. You'll get a chance to meet every single person in the room that night by circling around the tables. Anybody who's been there before will know that it's just a moving thing. We will provide refreshments, so there's beer and wine and non-alcoholic, whatever you want. Um, and there will also be food, not dinner, but there will be food. And Sue makes the greatest meatball in the world. So that's the, the real first prize. And then there's, they're kind of lower and lower and lower after that, down to <laughs> chips and peanuts. So anyways, sign up, come and see us. I was afraid he was going to offer pies. I used to do that, but I don't think I, I can do that this year. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, please. Oh. Yes, you keep your clothes on. You don't have to come layered, as some people have done at past parties. <laughs> and now, please stand for him. Ten twenty. Woyoya. Woyoya. be seated for our closing words. Today we have been inspired to take steps to learn more about and reconcile with our Indigenous neighbours for the benefit of all of us who call this great country home. And in doing so we'll remember some of Chief Dan George's words. Everyone likes to give and receive. We have taken something from your culture. I wish you could take something from our culture, for there are some beautiful and good things in it. Don't let us die like a wounded deer that has crawled away into the forest to bleed and die alone. Help us to love each other and share with us, for the only thing that can truly help us is genuine love that lifts up its head and sees in each other's eyes an answering love of trust and acceptance. This is personhood. Anything else is not worthy of the name. And we will remember Ken's many encouraging ideas among them. True re reconciliation will happen when Indigenous people have the appropriate level of prosperity and are treated fairly in all areas of life, education, business, health, policing, etc., when they have opportunities equal to those of other Canadians. And the journey toward reconciliation is one in which we need to be humble, open, and go gently. A new relationship with our Indigenous neighbours awaits us if we're willing to learn lots and aspire to see the world in a different light. And now, we extinguish this flame We go forth with courage and love.
You'd think we'd have that down pat now, wouldn't you? <laughs> and now please join hands or touch elbows as you prefer to sing our closing song, Circle Round for Freedom.